Hey guys, this is Frank Decker, and you're listening to Submission Radio. Hey, this is Rich Franklin. What's up, everybody? This is Chris Lieben. This is Diego Sanchez. Randy Couture. Alice Overeem. Hi, this is Stefan Bonner. This is Don Fry. Hey, I'm Phil, Mr. Wonderful Davis. DJ Dillashaw. You're listening to Submission Radio. Submission Radio. Submission Radio. Submission Radio. You're listening to Submission Radio. Welcome to Submission Radio, episode 203. It is the 18th of March here in a, well, interesting time in our lives. Dennis Crowder here with Kasper Rosalowski, bringing you guys some much needed entertainment during the crazy lockdowns and stuff that's happening in the world today. Cast a lot of bleak stuff happening all over the place, but here at Submission Radio, we are keeping it light. We're not focusing on the craziness. And uh, this is your break from the coronavirus, if you're tuning in right now, from wherever in the world you are at. I know, normally we'd be talking about how if you're in the gym, on the way to work, here, there, everywhere. I mean, we pretty much know where you are right now. You're (laughs) probably at home, bunkered down because of this coronavirus mania. So like Dennis said, a little bit bit of sunshine in your ears, a little bit of fun. We're very, very lucky this week to get some sexy, juicy guests on the program. I think everyone's in the same boat. Everyone's like, look... Submission Radio will call me again. I have nowhere to be, no excuses I can find. <laughs> Everyone knows that we're at home, so here we are on, on the program. We've got John Anik coming to the program, UFC commentator, great man to speak to, and he'll be kicking off the show. Obviously, to talk about you know this coronavirus effect on the UFC, the postponed events, this fallout from UFC London. Tony and Khabib will be a massive, massive theme of the show because obviously that is one of the biggest ones that everybody is concerned about, wondering will that actually happen, and if it does, where? In Antarctica, on a raft, somewhere floating in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, a submarine, a jungle perhaps? Anyway, these questions and more answered on this week's episode. Uh, Ben Askren joining the program, returning. I mean, who better to talk about the whole fallout of this whole UFC London thing, the welterweight uh, picture? Obviously, Usman and uh, Jorge Masvidal, but also UFC London, you know, Leon Edwards, Tyra Woodley, Colby Covington, the the, the love triangle of of hatred, essentially. So Ben Askren to talk about that a whole lot more. Obviously, Tony and Khabib as well. Got to get his thoughts on that. Javier Mendez. Uh, one of the men with the answers. I mean, obviously everyone's freaking out about Tony Khabib, so we figured we'd get Javier Mendez, uh, Khabib's coach, to talk about obviously the preparation for this fight, how it has been altered, you know, in in wake of this whole coronavirus situation, and then the man himself, the man of of the hour, the man of the week, Colby Covington, the man who offered to step up, on, I believe, six days' notice to fight Tyler Woodley at UFC London. He's going to be on the program as well. So. Hopefully that entertains you. John Anik, Ben Askren, Javier Mendez, and Colby Covington. It is a juicy show this week for you guys. That's right, Cass. John Anik, Ben Askren, Javier Mendez, and Colby Covington. What an episode of Submission Radio. And to everybody out there, I know the media's been super negative. And by the way, don't forget that. Media makes money by getting you to click headlines and freaking people out and making it seem like the world's a horrible place. But, you know, we just want to remind everybody, be positive. You know, be careful, be positive, and make sure to take this time. Look, it's it's a forced holiday for a lot of people. So make sure to catch up on all your favorite movies. Make sure to check out all your favorite things. And, you know, and sit down, relax. You have nowhere to be. Mm. Check out this episode of Submission Radio. Cass, we have our first guest on the line, and I believe you are about to introduce him. All right, guys, our first guest is the voice of the Octagon. You know him from his amazing work commentating the biggest moments in the UFC's history. His podcast with also fellow legend Kenny Florian remains to be one of the best listens in the sport, especially in these times where people are staying at home. He's worked across ESPN, been in movies like Warrior, and now he joins us here today. I love that he's wearing the UFC Fight Pass shirt and he's got a sick office because it kind of makes it feel like an unofficial broadcast in a time when it's needed. John (laughs) Anik. Welcome back to Submission Radio. How are you, man? Pleasure to be with you guys. I kind of wish I could see you, but that's okay. I, I'm i in my master bedroom, so oh. I appreciate the plug of the office, right? I got a little nook here that uh, I've sort of turned into a makeshift office. But, yeah, had them build me a desk, and uh, here we are, man. Some, some crazy days, obviously, but it's good to be with you. And I like how when you talk about a podcast, you say listen and not watch because you guys are obviously radio guys. The mm. Submission Radio, and uh, I appreciate that you say listen and not watch, because for the audio people out there, they got to appreciate that. Mm. <laughs> well, we, look, we appreciate you joining us, and first of all, we know you're a keen gambler, so tell us, how has the process been of finding stray, strange odds for event cancellations, corona-related betting gone for you? Have you found any strange ones you can share with us? That's so funny. Uh, somebody just 
put out there on social media that you can bet on the weather. So uh, I'm trying to find find a line as to whether or not it'll rain uh, here in South Florida tomorrow. We'll see if we can get a little bit of action. But got to be honest <laughs> with you guys, you know, with 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 the kids home from school, uh, it is all in, you know, trying to provide some sort of semblance of, of education and obviously exercise every day. And, uh, you know, I don't know what your realities have become, but uh I don't know. This is the movie that just won't end, and uh, I'm hopeful that uh, people are heeding the right advice and staying as safe and healthy uh, as possible. I know. The, the reality here in Australia is a toilet paperless reality, uh, John. It's, it's, yeah. basically, it's basically pandemonium, mainly in the toilet paper aisles. But I'm just wondering, obviously, <laughs> you're, you're in a super tough spot because you and the entire UFC staff, you don't really have any idea what's going on. We're all kind of in the dark. And obviously, three events postponed just early this week. Just out of curiosity, which ones were you scheduled to work? So initially, I wasn't going to work the March 21st show in London, but mm-hmm. when that show got moved to the U.S., I, I was put on that show. Uh, I was going to hope to be able to drive there. It looked like Oklahoma was going to be the final destination, which from South Florida is is no picnic. You know, I was holding out hope it was going to be Alabama because it just didn't seem safe. And if you don't know where South Florida is, super far from Perth, for example, uh, oh. it's it's very very south eastern united states so way way away from uh a lot of places and hard to drive places so major airports didn't seem uh realistic so uh how, how much thankfully did you though, get? Uh, sorry to cut in there john but like you weren't scheduled to work it and then you must have gotten a call how, how much notice did you get but hey we need you you know this weekend and then and then we well, don't they, need you anymore well right and thankfully that call did come in you know because i do think for a lot of staffers and fighters with respect to the money, there was some relief when uh, the, those two events got postponed just because of our families and uh, and everything else trying to heed the national warnings, right, in terms of gatherings. But, no, they were good about it. You, the UFC was good about it. You know, they said there's no wrong answer when they were asking us as to whether or not we were able to, to work a show or get there. Uh, they got ahead of it even when the London show was on, they put me on notice that there might be a late call if that show got moved stateside. So they tried to get ahead of it. They tried to continue with the live events. And, uh, you know, we'll see what happens. It's crazy, though. I mean, I can tell you that April 18th, uh, come hell or high water, however I have to get there, if it's leaving the U.S., you know, I got to go. I feel like, you know, at this point, promotionally, they work so hard to keep the live events going that I certainly owe it to them to try to get my ass there and, and give it a few weeks. But uh, there are a lot of unknowns out there right now. And uh, the fact that they're letting us step aside for a month here uh, is helpful to to all parties, you know. Mm. Khabib versus Ferguson, UFC International Waters. I'm just wondering, what do you think, John? How likely, if you're, you're a man who likes a bet, if you're a betting man, would you be betting that this goes down still or, or would you would you bet on the fact that it's not going to happen? I would ask Dana White's permission to bet <laughs> if there was a line on it, it happening, right? Because you don't bet against Dana White. You mm. know, he'll put on a live event when nobody else is going to do mm. it, you know. And uh, I think there's some credit there. You know, I had some trepidation, obviously, in terms of the travel, but I think he deserves credit in some respects for being bullish about it. Um, But we'll see what happens from here. But I would certainly bet on that fight happening. Uh, I think what's interesting is is 10 people or fewer. And that is sort of the declaration coming down from our national government. I guess as the play-by-play guy, I don't need to be in the arena. I could be in an edit trailer outside. And whoever's doing the post-fight interviews could be inside the arena or go in to do that. I mean, there are logistical things with that type of limitation, but uh, if anybody's capable of putting on a show, it's Dana and his team and uh, a team that I'm proud to be a part of. Honestly, you know, there are a lot of television live production ramifications in terms of our staff and people reaching out and trying to make the right decisions. And, uh, you know, we're excited to get back to work whenever that call comes in. Yeah, I almost feel like it needs to be a live fight companion from uh, Joe Rogan's headquarters <laughs> in Los Angeles and just put yeah. that as the commentary. But yeah. no, in all seriousness, it's a good I idea. Mean, a, well, there you go. I, I expect a 10% check, <laughs> check in the mail. Yeah, from we'll cut you in there. Yeah, we'll cut you in there. Uh, finally, we get to make some money from this industry. But let me ask you this. <laughs> let, let me ask you this, though, man. Have you spoken to Joe? Is Joe willing to go along to international waters, Russia, Mars, wherever this Khabib Tony Ferguson fight takes place? Or is he you know, sort of on the fence? That's a great guy? question. I've begged him to come to Australia for Israel Adesanya, yeah. uh, and he's respectfully told me no. Uh, so he has some travel limitations. Anybody who's monitors his, his schedule knows that he hasn't worked a show outside of North America in a while. So he and I in D.C. were texting a little bit just sort of uh, not about the 
this mass uh, uh, and magnitude of what we're all dealing with. But uh, I don't know for if if any fight I would think right would get Joe Rogan to uh, hit the road and uh, call for the passport. It would have to be Khabib Nurmagomedov versus Tony Ferguson. I think it's the biggest singular fight in UFC history, and a lot of people think that's promotional hyperbole. A lot of people think I'm a shill when I say nice things about Adesanya, who uh, is doing things that we've never seen before in a lot mm. of respects. But Khabib, Tony, biggest singular fight in UFC history. Ferguson, first guy to get a double-digit winning streak at 155 pounds. Never lost his title, obviously. And the other guy's fucking 28 No, you know, in, yeah. in the best, what is ubiquitously regarded as the best UFC division. It is the most significant singular UFC fight and, and one of the most significant sporting events of my lifetime. And uh, at least as we sit here on St. Patrick's Day, March 17th, it's still on. Yeah. And at no point was anything that you just said hyperbole at all. And I really hope that that ends up being a soundbite. Like, you know, when people are making those hype videos on YouTube, it's like yeah. one guy's this and that. And the other guy's fucking 28. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, right. if, if you had to guess sort of where this fight ends up, I'm just, I'm curious where you would guess. That, you know, a Apex Center with, um, well, with no crowd, wouldn't that be insane? No crowd for a fight like that? Well, what would be insane too, right? I mean, a no crowd event, I, we all witnessed that, which just was crazy. But mm. again, if you're talking, there can only be a limited number of cameramen in there if these restrictions don't get pulled back. So that affects the way you do the telecast. Mm. Uh, it, it's crazy that this is our reality. I think the only inkling any of us have is Dana White suggesting that it was going to be international and he would take it international if he has to. Uh, certainly, I think the apex makes a lot of sense. Our whole staff is there. There's a whole infrastructure here that a lot of people don't realize. So I'm supposed to, you know, voice the Columbus show 10 days out, right? So that would be tomorrow. Never mind, you know, getting ready to do a London show if that fight got put on my plate. So there's a whole process getting video of all the fighters. Mm -hmm. So... I'm hoping that for the staff's sake that they can find a way to to keep most of them in Vegas to do their work. But most of these staff members have to go where the fighters are, as you guys know all too well. So a uh, lot of balls in the air. But, uh, you know, I, it's crazy. Like five days in, cab cabin fever or otherwise, you know, I locked my master bedroom door. I'm itching to call a fight if you can't tell, you know. <laughs> I wonder if Dana White can just do it in his backyard, never back down yeah. for style and just, yes. you know, set that yeah. bad boy up. Yeah. But I'm just curious, commentating, you, you've spoke to us about the work that you do and how much the cr the crowd influences what you do. And, man, we have right. seen some crazy calls where, and we'll talk about it later, where you guys just go absolutely nuts. And that's a lot to do with what's happening in the Octagon, but a lot yeah. to do with what's happening in the crowd. I mean, how do you do your job that you're supposed to do, possibly being far removed from even the fight in the Octagon? How, how difficult would that make it for you, do you think? It's a good question. We have obviously talked about the crowd being a performance enhancer for play-by-play uh, -play announcers. You know, I did a fight for ESPN, I think a WBC heavyweight boxing fight, Vitaly Klitschko against Shannon Briggs uh, with BJ Flores, I think back in the day. I don't know the year. Uh, but it, it, the fight took place in Germany, and we called it from Bristol, Connecticut. And mm -hmm. boxing's a different sport in a lot of respects. Maybe aren't as many high-intensity, high-amplitude moments uh, over 13 fights, per se. Um, but that was a challenge, just not being there. Also, we had a situation where we lost the audio for a UFC show. So Kenny Florian and I, back in the day, I uh, flew to L.A., and recalled some fights from Japan. And I think I joked with you guys, you know, yeah. I think I know what Frank Mir is about to do here. I might as well <laughs> cheat this call because it's going to be the soundtrack of, of future record. Uh, mm. So there have been some circumstances where I have called sporting events without a lot of people there. And uh, I'll, I'll drink all the monster energy I have to to make sure that I can somehow simulate that crowd. And, you know, even when we voice video games, they simulate crowd noise in our ears. Uh, I don't know if they did that on Saturday, uh, but it's just uh, sort of like a white noise almost in your ear, which I think is super helpful. But uh, the thing is, too, when you're doing a TV broadcast, unlike when you're doing a video game where you're just laying out vocals, I need to communicate with the truck. I don't know that I want that white noise. So maybe we can rewind this a minute and not let my producer get any ideas. But, uh, you know, we'll sounds. see what happens. You know, yeah, I mean, I, like it, it certainly the works for the video. It certainly helps you do it. Yeah, it certainly helps when you're doing a video game. I can't say for live mm. TV that I recommend it, but we'll see. I think all you really need is McManion doing his woos and you're, yeah. you should be all good from the UFC Brazil. <laughs> let, let me let me ask you this, though, man, because 
Um, I was watching one of your IG feeds and you said something to me that kind of blew my mind and I just want to quickly circle back to it. It was before UFC 248 and I think you were on the way to hosting, not the the main event, but there was some kind of show and you talked about how um, Joe Silva told you that, you know, don't forget to have fun out there and how if you have so much pressure on your shoulders when you go out there. It's it's one of the last things that you have. And that kind of blew my mind because me and Casper, we do this show and a lot of people think, oh, these guys are having... The time of their lives, but yeah. you know, we're stressed out about a thousand things. And I don't know, you know, we have fun, but it, it, there's a lot of other things happening in our mind. Tell us a little bit about that process, about not kind of being able to have fun doing this dream job that you always wished yeah. you had. And what was the closest or the last time you remember to having actual fun out there, not being stressed out about what's next? Well, it was definitely UFC 248 and Weili Zhang and Jessica Andrade. Mm. Excuse me, Weili Zhang and Ioana Jacek. Mm-hmm. Uh, and again, it's a reminder to have fun. And Joe Silva, I think, thought I was a little bit tense early on and and maybe a little bit too technical and probably guilty as charged on both fronts. But uh, just a reminder that this is what you worked your whole life to do. So if you get the seat, you might as well enjoy it and really try to focus more on the fun. And I would always say, but bro, it's like... I got people talking to my ear. It's seven hours. It's 13 fights. We're trying to be seamless, you know, make everybody happy. Television partners go to break on time. You know, there's a lot of different elements that go into a broadcast. So I'm never more focused than when I'm walking to an arena. And I think oftentimes in life, when you're a picture of focus and focus on the task at hand, when a lot of businessmen are doing their job, they're not thinking about fun, you know? So I'm thankful that I have a job that I always wanted because I wanted work to be fun. I want to work in sports and have it be fun. And and this has exceeded, obviously, all of my wildest dreams. But uh, I tried to give that sort of insight to people, I think, because it's, uh, yeah. it's yeah. not always like a picnic. That's all. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah. And, and I think that sort of a lot of people can relate because it relates to a lot of jobs and a lot of potential dream jobs that, you know, people have this perception yeah. of, oh, it's all fun and games. And it's, it's actually yeah. a lot of hard work, a lot of stress. And Obviously, you're very good at your job, so it shows, you know, how much how much effort you put in. Uh, but I'm just wondering, I want to get your sort of thoughts on this past week uh, and the fallout, John, because obviously, you know, Leon Edwards supposed to go in there and fight Tyra Woodley, which was an, an awesome fight that people were looking forward to. Now, it's very unclear about what's going to happen next. Woodley is saying that he wants Colby Covington. Colby Covington was willing to step up on short notice. We're going to speak to him in a second and see if, you know, he's still interested in that fight. Um, it almost seems like Leon Edwards is going to get screwed over again. What, what do you think should be next oh. for these guys, you know, as, as it sort of plays out after this weekend? Well, as I said on our podcast, Leon Edwards has already earned a UFC championship opportunity as far as I'm concerned. So I think, you know, he's the guy who gets the short end of the stick in all of this. And not that he cares about my opinion, but I hope he hears it. And I hope he understands that uh, a lot of us believe that on any given Saturday night, he is the best welterweight in the world and has earned that rematch against Kamar Usman. So I hope he's not the forgotten man. You know, I would think that his package of skills is a package that a lot of people would be trying to avoid. And I do give Tyron Woodley as a former champion, a lot of credit for his willingness to go on the road and fight Leon Edwards. Of course, the fight isn't going to happen, but uh, you know, I'd like to see my buddy T Wood, you know, I've spent time with Woodley in Ferguson, Missouri. I would like to see him, you know, give Leon Edwards that opportunity. I understand the magnitude of a, a Covington Woodley fight but uh mm-hmm. you know front and center for me in terms of Leon Edwards in terms of his body of work and and how worthy he is of getting that big fight that eliminator or that championship fight mm. I, I want to ask you this John obviously it, it's no secret that obviously the UFC have come under fire recently for you know not postponing their schedule when other major organizations were I'm wondering if you were sort of relieved I know I know you mentioned earlier that there was some relief were you kind of relieved when the these events did get postponed. And also, I know that like you are not the payroll department, so I don't expect you to have the answer. Um, but do you know if any of the fighters will be sort of getting compensated or paid for the events? Obviously, Bellator sort of cancelled their events and right. um, did pay the fighters. And I know in an ideal yeah. world, we'd, we would all love to see the fighters sort of, you know, getting compensated. Right. Yeah, I, you know, certainly there was some relief, I think, for most UFC staffers when uh, at least these two events in late March, you know, got canceled. There were a lot of unknowns. If I was on the the Brasilia show, I already would have been there and I certainly wouldn't have fought my way home. I would have called the fights and and honored that commitment. But logistically, it just became very difficult to think about calling 
fights and leaving the family, coming back and being quarantined from the family. Never mind what the fighters were going through, trying to cut weight and avoid major airports for them, if at all possible. So it seemed logistically like uh, a huge ass to think that March 21st was going to happen. But we all thought March 28th was going to happen. So for mm -hmm. us, it's like a week or two here or there. So I'm starting to think, all right, I'm going to Oklahoma for two weeks, right? Call the fights March 21st, March 28th. At least I'll be away from my family quarantined if I'm around germs and the virus and everything else. So that was my lens. But my mom and everybody else certainly relieved when uh, we didn't get the call. As far as the fighters are concerned, I don't know how they're going to monitor the schedule. Certainly, hopefully, the, the London fighters at the very least would be compensated as far as future shows. Mm. I don't know if they're just going to push the whole schedule back. And those Columbus guys, you know, who knows how loaded this this next UFC pay-per-view is going to be uh, yeah. three weeks into April. Uh, you could have Ngannou Rosenstrike on that fight card. But uh, again, I think what was my biggest takeaway as a UFC staffer and for UFC fighters was the medical stuff, right? If my one and a half year old son gets the coronavirus or shows symptoms and I can't get to a doctor in South Florida, um, you know, I can call the UFC and they're going to get me to a doctor here in Florida. And uh, that's the case for the entire roster of 600 plus. So uh, mm. at least there is that, which uh, I think is assuring to a lot of people. But, uh, you know, I, I wish I had a bunch of money to give the fighters. You know, I feel like a lot of people feel that way. Right. Uh, and even some of our TV production people who uh, who may not realize a payday and need some money. You know, it's just a tough thing. I got fans asking me for money. I wish I could give them all thousands of dollars. I really do. You know, mm. Wow, you got your fans messaging you, asking you for well, money. Well, fathers, that's, that's you big, know. Uh, okay. Fathers I was going to say, that's of, the big move. Daughters, <laughs> you know, I, it is. Well, and I'll be honest hey, with John, you. Hey, John, I'm the big fan. You reckon you can well, break hey. off about 350? Dude, I've fought with my wife. I mean, I've, I've fought with my wife about, about giving people money. And there have been certainly times uh, where somebody will be like, dude, I'm having a really bad day. Here's my PayPal number. I'm broke. What? I'll send them 10 no or way. 20 bucks here or there. Yeah, well. You know, wow. Well, hey, I messaged you the wrong thing the whole time. <laughs> but, yeah, <laughs> oh, right. No, just, <laughs> right. Like, just change your Twitter profile pic to uh, a picture of you with your two daughters uh, yeah. or with two little girls and say, I'm a single father of two. And no, but I mean, like, you know, you try to vet the person as best you can. But it, I'm telling you guys, if I was single, like, I'm such a sap right now with these UFC fans, you know, like, if I had a bunch of money and didn't have three kids, uh, you know, I would just be paying UFC fans left and right. I'm trying to figure out a way, you know, I'm doing something with uh, Helping Hands Boca Raton down here. We're trying to come up with something charitable to raise money uh, with Rivals Media, the company that I did a charity challenge with. So we're trying to figure this out. And, and obviously, you know, we're thinking about the fighters first and foremost, as always. That is an amazing revelation. I mean, we know you're a nice guy, John. We always tell people this, but this is just b beyond the our ah. expectation. When, when was the last time this happened that someone messaged you and you, you sent out a, a cheeky PayPal, you know, a donation to them. When, when was the last time this happened? I'm I'm arguing right now with my wife, so oh. she'll let me pay this father with two girls right now. You know. Wow. Jeez. I mean, uh, I guess the last payment was I don't know a year ago. It's not like I do this all the time. It hasn't probably Still. been more than you know a few hundred bucks. But uh, you know, I hey man, I don't know. It's uh, I think that for a lot of people, when something like this happens, we feel helpless. So it's like, you know, if I can donate some meals and you know a few hundred bucks and like if you know when you call like some of these food players they'll be like dude we yeah we can feed like 30 people on saturday with that it's like oh okay you know wow. that kind of makes a difference you know so we'll see uh we'll see what happens but there are a lot of good people much more powerful than me that are trying to do good things right now so that's good you're a kind man john anik uh, after this we'll have to figure out a way for you to fedex some toilet paper our way but seriously <laughs> yeah. though well, I, I need paper towels you know you yeah, don't be towels. selfish stop being selfish <laughs> don't toilet paper. we need it now um it. let's quickly yeah i have two daughters um let's quickly talk about the nba and the nhl though as well because man i know you're a massive sports fan as as yeah. am i and nba suspended nhl suspended i mean sports in general suspended i mean what do you think this virus and and this break does to sports in general, people are forecasting the fact that the NBA may not come back now. It's, it's unbelievable. Unbelievable. The Celtics may not get their shot at winning the playoffs. What's going on? It's just crazy when you think about, you know, you get a three-year window with Kemba Walker or the Lakers look primed to win a title mm. a few months after the legend Kobe Bryant passes away or Giannis Brooklyn and the Nets Bucks have the that, coronavirus. 
I crazy. The the city of Milwaukee feels like they're getting a championship, you know, and the season could be wiped away. Certainly us Boston Bruins fans believe we got the best team in hockey right now. It is a crazy, crazy reality. And, uh, you know, NFL free agency, I think, thankfully, in the States has has given us some normalcy. And certainly for the sports radio guys out there, I used to be one of them. Mm. They got a lot to talk about with what's going on with Tom Brady. And I think, thankfully, I think we're all just looking for something uh, to talk about that, that isn't this virus. But, uh, yeah, to see the league step aside, I just think ultimately they have no choice with how many bodies and locker rooms and shared space and, and everything else. It's uh, a recipe for disaster. I'm still holding out hope that they can salvage a postseason. Uh, it would be largely unprecedented, but I would I would hope that they could do a an NBA or Stanley Cup abbreviated postseason during the summer so that all the work the teams have put in doesn't just go to waste. But uh, it's crazy, man. We're going to look back at this time and hope that it was uh, just a blip and not, you know, anything that resembles a new normal. Yeah, 100%. Um, John, we could talk to you all day. It's been such a fun chat. We don't want to be too greedy with the time. So we'll end it on this, right? Last thing we want to touch on is obviously the now iconic reaction from Daniel Cormier, Joe Rogan, and yourself at UFC 248, yeah. which has now been immortalized by the artist Dos Brack, um, which is uh, absolutely awesome. I don't know if you got a chance to see that, but we know you're yeah. in the zone and reacting to the fight, but what was going on in your head in that moment? And what did you sort of think when you, you saw the, you know, the replay of all three of you at the same time? And then that iconic image. Oh, man. Well, we appreciate uh, that piece of art that might just be behind us here. He is going to send Ooh. me one. You know, I'm wondering, why are they running it back on broadcast right away? You know, I'm trying to call a fight. And two minutes later, they're showing the announcer cam. Uh, there are so many moments like this. And sometimes when I'm being self-critical, I'm thinking, man, are we just doing like, oh, like way too much. Mm. But I like you guys watch this sport, right? We're, we're charged with providing the soundtrack for it. So mm -hmm. I don't know any other way to proceed. I do remember when I first started, you know, I was doing it a little too much. I think even back then, maybe not as animated or as comfortable as, as I am now, but, uh, and they were like, you can scale back on the O's <laughs> a little bit, you know? Uh, but no, that is the nature of the sport. And that fight just, it went one way and then it went the other. And, uh, I think if Daniel Cormier doesn't lie down on top of Joe, it's not quite as iconic a moment. But uh, we've had a lot of those for sure, man. And the, the Kevin Lee, Gregor Gillespie one, you oh, know, yeah. when Rogan said right in front of us, I think that's why you saw that reaction from Megan and everybody else, because Gregor looked deceased uh, yeah. two feet away. So uh, it's a, it's a special seat and a special job. And, uh, you know, it's funny sometimes for us to see who's watching the monitor, who's actually watching the cage. Um, but yeah, man, another one down and, uh, excited to have new fights to talk about. You know, I think for you guys too, it's, it's interesting how we all approach, uh, this time, uh, professionally and otherwise. And, uh, we'll see, man, we'll see my man, how, where it goes from here, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And of course, Dosbrack, he put that image together. You guys can go and get that now. Unbelievable, uh, yeah. unbelievable moment in history. I think you guys underplay the fact that, yeah, you guys have a huge effect on the way people see fights and the way when you guys react like that i just think it's that extra special thing that makes those finishes so much better for people watching at home and for the fighters it's it's unbelievable you guys have something special and of course the dc lean something that oh. i expect to come out to all the to all the dance clubs as soon as it, this, yeah. this yeah. ban is lifted of course the man is, is about to fed it, FedEx us some toilet paper, some rice, yes. some pasta. Yes. So we don't want to keep him on the line too long. You can follow him on on Twitter and Instagram at John underscore Anik. Make sure to tune into the Anik Florian podcast, one of the best and longest MMA pods in the game. Absolutely unbelievable what you guys do with this podcast. I think it's totally underrated. You guys absolutely kill it with every episode. And people are very lucky wow. to still Thank be you. able to get this product. Yeah, people are still I appreciate lucky. It. All the kind words, you know, uh, we try to keep it short and sweet. You know, uh, we try to keep it a power hour digestible, you know, sort of know what you're going to get. And uh, I appreciate you saying that and all the kind words, you know, for us, I think oftentimes after a fight, uh, we just want to make sure we did right by the fan base and the fighters. And uh, we're just never trying to spin a narrative. So those hours can be pretty dark. Um, but thankfully, the feedback has been great and coming from somebody like you and you guys, uh, it, it means a whole lot. So thank you, man. You know, you got a mutual fan in me. Absolutely, man. It's, it's definitely mutual. And we appreciate you jumping on the program this week and chatting with us and sort of giving all the people that are granted at home a bit of entertainment. So thank you so much for your time, John. Really appreciate it. Thank you guys for your time. Anytime. Hey, this is Tony Okagui Ferguson, and you guys listen to Submission Radio. Keep tuning in, guys. 
All right, guys, it's always an honor having our next guest on. You can check out Flow Wrestling's new film about his wrestling style, The Funk. He's made his funky and FRB show free via Rockfin to help out with the current coronavirus isolation boredness. There's also the Funky Crypto Podcast, the Mental Monday videos on Twitter. Oh, my gosh, so much stuff. Deal with a number of tough issues, Ben, the tough issues. And do I need to mention the fact that you're a former one and Bellator champion, Ben? Funky Aspirin, welcome back to Submission Radio, man. It, it does feel like yeah. it's been too long, but that's because we like having you on the program. Absolutely. You guys got it. Yes. Um, I'm in a very, very lucky situation. I, I feel I, uh, well, you guys do kind of, you know, I get to, um, a lot of my work is from home, right? So mm. I can do all my podcasts and everything else from here. Um you know, we did have to close down the wrestling academies last Friday. I don't know how stuff is there in Australia, but it's it's pretty tough here. Uh, a lot of jobs and works closing down. Schools are all closed down. Uh, but so I, I'm like I said, I'm lucky enough to be able to do a lot of the stuff from my house. Yeah, I know. I was gonna say, like, how, how have you been dealing with with all this kind of stuff? How's the toilet paper supply in Askren household? Because here in Australia, it's, it's basically a drought of toilet paper countrywide. For real. Well, more or less, people are getting into fights in stores, you know? People could use I, this in funky yeah, wrestling. Toilet paper one, I've, I feel like I'm repeating myself because I've said this in a few other interviews. Like, I, I don't get the toilet toilet paper one. Like, yeah. you know, food should come way before toilet paper. If I had to wipe my butt with a, with a rag and wash the rag and then use it again, I could obviously do that, mm. right? Um, I mean, there's, there's a lot of different ways to wipe your butt and make sure that's clean. It doesn't involve toilet paper. You know, I get a bunch of old dirty socks. I don't know. I got yeah. a bunch of ways to do it, right? But I need yeah, I food. Know. I need food really bad. Well, Submission Radio really should have been a toilet paper company, and then we'd be in the money. But there you go. We're an MMA, <laughs> We're an MMA <laughs> podcast. Are We're... down also? Well, well no, not really, because we get to do it from home like yourself. So we're lucky with that regard. But, uh, yeah, a lot of MMA gyms, coaches, everyone out of a job here in Australia. So it's pretty tense. I was going to ask you, though, Ben. With this coronavirus, I know you mentioned on the Mental Monday video how, like, you've been in isolation since last Friday with your family. Do you reckon mm -hmm. if you were still active in the UFC and they wanted you to fight during these crazy times, you'd still be interested like a lot of these other fighters are? Huh. Um, that's an interesting question because, yeah, I am taking this seriously. Uh, that being said, obviously it would be a good opportunity because no, no, there's no other sporting events whatsoever. Um, you know what I think I, I would suggest that they fly me privately somewhere, right? So I don't have to go on a commercial airliner. So if they wanted me bad enough, they could probably do that. I wonder, right? Because there's there's almost like this debate, right? You see shows getting canceled, shows getting postponed, and, and you're hearing, oh, you know, but the fighters want to fight. And then the other side is, well, of course they want to fight because they, if they don't fight, they're not going to get paid. What, where do you stand on that whole thing and sort of, you know, people thinking, well, if, if shows are going to be postponed, the fighters should be compensated at least. That's dumb. Which part? Dumb. I mean, so obviously I think that, I think there's a lot of things... I'll run it from multiple angles. My first first thing I thought was that stupid. Um, because as a fighter, especially an up-and-coming fighter, you shouldn't be relying on your fight income to feed your family because you never know when you could get hurt, your opponent's going to get hurt, something's going to, right? Cards move all the time. Fighting is very fickle. Everything changes all the time. So if you, especially if you're an up-and-coming, you should not be relying on that paycheck to make a living. That, that's, that is a really terrible idea. Mm. Um, so that, that being said, I think there's numerous fighter issues, which fighters can't figure out how to get a group together to create some type of organization. I mean, like, um, say the NBA or the MLB or the uh, NFL, they all have players associations. And I think you could very easily do something where you have full-time health insurance. I mean, so the UFC provides insurance in the cage, specifically in the cage, but nothing else. Right. Mm -hmm. And so... Yeah. Uh, health insurance, some type of retirement plan. I mean, they, there's stuff that they, that we could do as fighters to put a. I'm not a fighter anymore. I'm retired, so <laughs> they they as fighters could do to uh, put together some type of association that would help them with numerous issues. Um, maybe this would be one of them. Maybe it wouldn't be. I'm not sure. Mm. What, what did you think about your friend Tyron Woodley? He was still keen <clears throat> on fighting this weekend, even accepting. Uh, wanting to accept this Colby Covington fight as a late replacement. What did you make of this whole fiasco around UFC London and Woodley? Um, 
I mean, obviously, from his perspective, I get. I mean, he's less than a week away when they cancel all this stuff, right? So it's like mm. he's put in all of this work, um, and then does doesn't get doesn't get any payoff at the end. So it's got to be highly frustrating for him. And so, yeah, I mean, you've done all that. Um, why not just go through with the fight and then hopefully then right after that, then, you know, you can quarantine yourself and stay at home or whatever. Mm. Hopefully, ho- hopefully sort of riding off into the quarantine sunset with a juicy <laughs> knockout win. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm just wondering though, like if, if either fight would have happened, who do you think would have been the tougher fight for Woodley? You know, Leon, uh, a guy who's obviously very tough and he's been preparing for, or Colby, who's also really tough, but you know, one week notice is just crazy. Yeah, one week that that would that, that's what hit me. One week notice is pretty crazy, and especially mm. the fact that he did break his jaw in his last fight. He can't he could not have been training for very long at all for this one. So, um, yeah, I don't know. It's gonna be interesting to see you know now which direction they go when they come back because obviously you could put the original fight together like they had Tyron and and um, Leon, or you could very easily uh, make Tyron versus Colby now when they come back. Which one would you prefer? And which one do you think is the tougher test? Tyron, Colby, Tyron Colby is the one I would prefer by far. I mean, Tyron's wanted to fight him forever. It just fell through a couple of times. Mm. It's interesting because uh, here Colby is in this situation where he didn't win the belt. And a lot of fans are caught, kind of not very happy with him after that Usman performance and some of the stuff. Why, that he why said. are they not? Oh, because he's, he's, he's an idiot. No, I mean, listen, well, yeah. what, do you expect the idiot to not say stupid things? Give me a break. Well, now he's in an interesting spot. Like, if he fought Tyron Woodley, let's say, this weekend and lost, where would that put him in the UFC, in your opinion? I mean, he's lost one. Now, he's if he loses a few fights in a row, is that is that sort of game over for him in this UFC run? No, in your opinion? fighting is fickle. Look at, I mean, the one I bring up is, like, George Masvidal was, like, uh, going to that Till fight, had lost uh, three of his last four or something like that. I mean, they're all the good opponents, but then... You know, he beats Till and then me, and then now he's the big, one of the biggest stars in the UFC, right? I mean, mm. Colby's a couple fights away from a title shot again, and that's how fighting works. Um, that being said, people don't like Colby, and they probably never will because he's a dipshit. <laughs> do, you, do you find it interesting, though, right, how, you know, you had this sort of relationship with Dana White in the UFC for years, and people kind of thought, you know what, if Dana White's going to have something against anyone, it's going to be yourself. But then once you came in the UFC, you know, everybody had a lot of love for you. But with Colby Covington, huh. despite, you know, him sort of being, I would say, a good promoter and obviously working hard to promote He's fights, not a good promoter. He's a very average promoter. But do you think he's put himself in an interesting position where he said so much stuff about the UFC where they may not be as keen to give him another title shot? Because if he has the belt, he's sort of got a lot of leverage. I mean, yeah, that's a good point. Colby, Colby's too stupid to understand how to play his cards. He's an average promoter. He's a, he's someone who puts a lot of effort into it, but is not really, really good at it. So there's someone like there's someone like a, a George Masvidal or a Nate Diaz. These are great examples of guys who do not put a lot of effort into promotion, but yet they still come out kind of looking good sometimes. Um, and then Colby puts a lot of effort into it, but he just, he doesn't have, he's not sharp enough to like say the right things at all the right times. And then number two, he's also not smart enough to understand the leverage he has or doesn't have with the UFC. I'm wondering, what, what is the key to good promotion in your mind? Because you're a guy who did it well and you, yeah. you've got an eye for these things. If you if you could pull the curtain back, what's the key to good promotion? Well, so what I mean, it's just like George Masvidal. I think he's kind of a dumb dumb, um, <laughs> but that's beside that's mm-hmm. kind of besides the point. But sometimes you accidentally fall into saying something like the three piece in the soda he said with Leon Edwards, right? Mm. Like that just went over. People loved it. Um, but one of the key things, you know, I think Connor is one of the best at this is reading the crowd and knowing what you have to say next. Like if you think about the time, um, man, I'm blanking on which fight it was, but it's a post fight speech. He says, you know, and he's kind of like talking and talking to him. He says, I would like to apologize uh, yeah. too. And you uh, think yeah. about, okay, well, who's he going to apologize to? And he says, absolutely effing no one. Yeah. You know, like, God, he nailed that. Like, yeah. I'm not even really a Connor fan, but he freaking nailed it, you know? And so it's like sometimes you have to feel the energy and the emotion in the room and kind of play to it. And and that's where Colby really misses, in my opinion. Yeah, it's 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 a fascinating time as well in the division because you got Mazadal here that he's supposed to fight Usman for the title. 
Do you, what, what do you think would happen if, for example, a Tyron Woodley did get a fight against a guy like Colby Covington before that fight even happened, and the UFC was unable to put together that title shot? Would Woodley, be, do you think, be in a position where he could leave Frog Masvidal, or is he just too much of a star at this point to do that? But uh, you being like, why, why would they change it up? Why would it go somewhere? You're saying because Ty, say if Tyron would have fought someone and then you know mm. fought someone last weekend and then they would have a break. Uh, I mean, I just feel I feel like Masvidal and Usman is next, and then you know whoever wins that Tyron Lee Edwards fight will probably get the next title shot after that. If say if Masvidal were to get hurt, then whoever you know whoever wins the Tyron fight is probably in there. Mm. It's it's interesting because the champ Usman he's. Uh... Tried to do his own, I suppose. I don't want to he's, say it's trash he's talk. He's terrible but he, too. He's well, terrible. I was going to ask you, thoughts. So what do you make? What do you make of this whole who thing? You know, he was like, who who is who? He was try, trying not to sort of acknowledge him and pretending like it's he doesn't so know who he is. Because it's like he's not funny when he says it. So I, okay, obviously we know it's a lie, right? So but sometimes you can go ahead and say things that everyone knows it's a lie. But if you say it in a really funny way, people can kind of laugh at it. Hmm. But he's not funny at all, right? And everyone knows he's lying. That's obvious. Um, the <laughs> one where he, I think Usman is like the worst promoter in the history of mixed martial arts. Because for me, here's what Colby is literally the most hated promoter, uh, personality, fighter in the UFC, right? And so when Usman's going against him, it's like, okay, you got the bad guy, Colby. And then you got Usman, who all he has to do is he's got to play the good guy. And everyone's going to love him and everyone's going to cheer for him, right? Mm. But Usman just could not figure out how to make people like him. Like, he just couldn't figure it out. Like, it would be so easy to make Kobe the bad guy. He's already the bad guy. He already plays the bad guy. It's so simple. Just just play into that and you're you're the good guy. You're the face. Everyone loves you. But Usman couldn't figure out how to do it. Mm. I was interested because Conor McGregor was sort of mentioning Usman during the UFC 246 fight week. And it, the camera even cut to Usman at one point during the post-flight speech, and it didn't look like Usman. Usman never acknowledged Conor McGregor or anything like that. Do you think that was a big mistake on his part, not sort of trying to run with it a little bit, possibly for the future? I think uh, I'm blanking on exactly what he did, but it was probably something. It was like stupid. trying to file his nails when they cut. Yeah, to him. he was trying to act like he didn't care. Like, okay, like you shut up. I mean, that was that was yeah, that was absurd. That's what it was. It was totally absurd. It's interesting. I mean, he probably knows. At least maybe he's maybe he's halfway intelligent enough to understand that he's he's not going to get that fight. I mean, McGregor's not going to fight Usman next because nobody knows who Usman is. He's going to take a bigger fight. <laughs> um, just with Usman and and Masvidal, it's interesting because obviously two guys that you know very well. How how do you see that fight uh, playing out, Ben? I don't think Usman probably has the advantage in that fight, but uh, you know, I, I think there's definitely ways that Masvidal could win it for sure. How, how how would you see him winning it if if he was to do it? Striking, I think he would outstrike Usman, but I I also doubt he's going to be able to keep it on his feet. It's interesting because you fought, you, you got a chance to fight some of the big names in the welterweight division. Obviously, you're one of the reasons why Masvidal is as big as he is, and you had that yeah. you know great great interesting matchup with. Robbie Lawler, but a lot of people are kind of disappointed because you never, you never actually fought Usman yourself. Is he, is he someone where you're like, oh man, like this is a fight that I could have had. Like, is, is he one of the guys that you? Yeah, wish you I fought blew it. I had right? I blew it. I didn't win. I, I win the Masvidal fight. I got that. I blew it. You guys trying to rub it in? <laughs> nah, not at all. Not at all. I just, I, 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 think, I think we're still not over it. We still wish there was a, a way that you could fight Usman, or it did happen. Uh -oh. I blew it. I blew it. I apologize to uh, everybody. At, le at least the Marty thing is still alive, right? So there's there's a legacy <laughs> on Usman there, right? So at least you're not around, but people are referring to him as Marty. Does that make you laugh when it still gets brought that, up? That was his name. That wasn't even trying to be mean. That was just his name. I l also, I love how you just apologize to everybody. You did the 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 reverse Conor McGregor. There was no there was no plot twist there. You actually apologize. Which, you, by the way, you don't owe anybody apology. <laughs> Just, Apologize to myself mainly. <laughs> who who would you say is the and I'm not trying to rub it in, but who would you say is the yeah. one guy where you're just like, oh man, that's that's the guy that I really wanted to to fight, you know, before before sort of hanging it up. Well, really, my only purpose in coming, so I was retired the first time. The only purpose I came back was to win win the title, and so you know what I wanted was the shortest possible path there, and that you know I I did a pretty damn good job. I had Robbie. Everyone was pretty well acknowledging if I beat George, I was going to get the title shot. And, uh, 
and I messed it up. So, you know, at, at, when I came back, the only purpose I had was to um, to make a run of the title, and that's it. Mm. I, th- I thought you were going to say GSP. I thought GSP was old. Well, that will be awesome. Yeah. I didn't deserve it. I lost. Damn it all. <laughs> I'll tell you what, man. You, you 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 say like you didn't do nothing. You're the reason. You're one of the biggest reasons why Jorge Masvidal is the star that he yeah. is. So, and you help build up the division. Let's talk about your concept for this Khabib Tony fight happening possibly in Russia. <laughs> Break this down for us, because I feel yeah, like you're you are now officially a matchmaker. Well, I mean, the one thing I said last night. Let's not get greedy, Dana. Let's make this really simple. All we need is is Tony and Khabib. We don't need that effing undercard. So you got you need, in America. I don't know what they're doing in Australia. In America, they're doing ten right now, like ten people minimum. So our maximum. Mm. You can't have more than ten people in a group. So you got Tony, Khabib, three judges. But you could also have the judges be remote, so you don't have to actually have them there. Mm-hmm. You have a referee. You have Dana. You have Bruce Buffer. And you have Joe Rogan, maybe, and maybe, right? Hey, look, you know, we don't even give. Maybe, maybe we take the judges, make the judges remote at a remote location, and we give them each uh, two coaches or something, or one coach. I think there's a way to do it to keep it under ten people um, and broadcast it. See, I like this. This needs to be a, a Ben Asker and you know UFC collaboration. If if you had to sort of put money on it, do you think this fight happens? Because gauging the the MMA community's sort of feelings, everyone's like, there is just no way this is going to happen. Yeah, it's man, it's just things are changing literally every 24 hours or something different. So mm. I, I think we'll know a lot more, you know, let's say uh, a week from now, um, like this Sunday night, I bet we'll have a much clearer picture of where it's going to go. It, it, it is a fascinating matchup, a fight that people have been waiting for for it's a long awesome. time. Please, Look, please. I mean, do, do, you know, do you know who wins that one? Do you think... Do you think I don't. Get it I think it's fascinating. That's why it's so exciting. Well, is that sort of the main thing that you love about it? It's a bit of a, a pick and fight. Yeah, and well, and they're, they're, yeah. I mean, it's because it's it's two guys who are really good at what they do, and and if you were to design a fighter to beat the other person, that's what you would design them to do. And so I think it's going to be really, really um, fascinating. How do you feel like they, they match up on the ground? Because um, obviously, you know, Khabib's ground is is, is the his bread and butter, but Tony's so willing yeah. to fight off his back. How do you see... Do, do you think yeah. Tony can implement his, his you know, offense off his back against a guy like Khabib? Yeah, I mean, so it's, Khabib's obviously going to get the takedowns, and he's been so dominant with ground and pound. But at the same time, Tony is so active off his back, and he's good with the elbows, and he's got a lot of tricky stuff. And so, it, it, yeah, I think it's going to be totally fascinating. I'm, I'm excited to see what happens. As, as someone who understands, obviously, the wrestling and the gras- grappling aspect yeah. so so well, what, what if you had to sort of say, like, the key to beating Khabib, if, if there's one thing that maybe people have overlooked, what, what would you say it is? And do you think Tony sort of possesses well, I, I, that? I, I think Tony's a great fit because Tony's not going to stay put on bottom. Tony can take a lot of damage, which, you know, Khabib will dish it out. Tony doesn't get tired. And then Tony's a high volume striker. He's not a power power puncher, um, which I don't think is the right mix to beat Khabib because um, I think you have to kind of fight him hard, stop stuff you take down and volume strike him. Um, and I think that's how you're going to beat him. And that's kind of what um, that's what he does. You know, that's what Tony does. So I think there's a possibility. The other the crazy thing about Tony, like if you follow him on social media, is he's just got such unorthodox training. You see, did you what see is, recently what where he's he even doing? I posted the one last night. What is he even <laughs> doing? Who knows? Do you look at that as a fighter and go, this is extremely high risk stuff? Or do you see it and you're like, look, I, I understand, you know, what, no, what he's doing here? I have no idea what he's doing ever. <laughs> I never is, is it safe? Idea. Is it safe to say at this point that Tony Ferguson, out of the whole UFC roster, will be the most likely guy to survive this uh, zombie <laughs> yeah. outbreak that we're dealing with right now after all yeah. this kind of training? Yeah. <laughs> I actually think uh, Tony Ferguson is a part of like an Ocean's Eleven type gang, and they're waiting to rob a casino while this whole strip uh... thing shuts down during the virus. I don't know. He didn't. <laughs> kind of. kind of reminds me of that. Let me just quickly ask you this, and we'll let you go, Ben, because we do appreciate your time. <clears throat> Conor McGregor, where does he fit in all this for you? I mean, we're talking about the Who fact knows? that this fight. Yeah, well, what if this fight gets canceled? Does the UFC just jump to Khabib, Conor McGregor too? Or do you think Tony Please Ferguson don't. keeps his title shot? God, like, people are so interested in the Tony and Khabib thing. Mm. Despite the star power that Conor would bring, I got to think they match up Tony and Khabib again. 
Um, I thought could be. I thought Connor would fight George, but that did, that obviously didn't happen. So, and I'm not really sure why that didn't happen. Um, and usually Connor kind of has an idea what his next target is, but it's been near two months since his fight, and we haven't really heard about what his target is going to be. So, I I find that to be interesting. I know Ariel's been reporting that. I don't know if it's Connor or the UFC, but someone's targeting potentially Connor versus Justin Gaethje. Do you have much interest in that fight? Ooh, I would watch that. Yeah, I would watch that. What, what do you like about that one? Um, I think it is. Uh, I mean, I, I think it's like Connor's going to hit him, but I think Justin Gaethje can take a lot of damage. Is Justin Gaethje going to, you know, wear through the damage and land a bunch of leg kicks and hit him back? You mm. know, what's going to happen there? Mm. Obviously, he did the whole welterweight thing against Cowboy Serrani as a welterweight yourself. Do you think he has a future in that division, or is that Cowboy Serrani thing just kind of a, a return fight for him? Uh, I mean, Serrani's a lightweight. I mean, obviously, he's fought at welterweight a few times, but Serrani is a lightweight. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think he could fight some guys. that he's going to be disadvantaged against the, the biggest, strongest guys for sure. Well, I'll tell you what, man. We appreciate you coming in. I just want to quickly highlight the fact that you guys, you and Front Row Brian, have made your podcast on Rockfin free for everybody yeah. who's stuck at home. Tell us a little bit about what people can expect. Well, because so yeah. Rock, Rockfin, yeah, Rockfin is um, it's a content aggregator. It was started by my friend Martin Floriani, who started Flow Sports. And just the idea is that all content aggregators, such as YouTube or other places, um, they essentially are able to do whatever they want with the content creators, right? They have they have the upper hand once they grow, and so this is a new new type of platform um, where content creators such as myself or anybody else can hop on there and put content on there and uh, and be adequately rewarded. So um, you know most stuff most of our stuff goes behind a paywall, but I figured since people will be so bored uh, until the coronavirus is over, we will just put everything up for free. I'll tell you what, I know a lot of people have spoken about the podcast, but I didn't have a chance to check it out. There's that, there's the cryptocurrency podcast. I feel like people are going to get rich and also get to know who Front Row Brian really is because of this yeah. uh, this uh, opportunity. Guys, make sure to follow Ben on Twitter and Instagram, at Ben Askren, his podcast, uh, Front Row Brian, Funky, Funky and FRB and Funky Crypto Podcast, all up on Rock for Now. And of course, check out his Twitter where he inspires us on the regular every Monday. Can we get a little sneak peek? What's happening next Monday? What are you going to be talking about? Oh, now? man, I don't come up with my topics that, that far ahead of time. I mean, I've kind of done a few mental Mondays this week. Um, and while well, I was talking to a coach about the things I learned, I did a, I was going to write a book about a decade ago, and I interviewed, huh. did a, a questionnaire of the of all the NCAA champions the last 50 years, and, I, and he – he was curious as to what the best things I learned from that were. And so I was going to, I was, I, you know, we, we talked about it for a while and uh, I was thinking about making that a mental Monday. I might just even do that today because shit, everyone's bored and everyone's at home. So why not? Yeah. Love it. And of course you've got the beautiful fire, the beautiful house, and there's some chickens running around in the background. Yeah. So it's all a pleasant view for all of us. So Mr. Funky Ben Askren, thank you so much for joining us on the program. Thanks a lot guys. Appreciate it. This is Chael Sonnen and you are listening to Submission Radio. All right, guys, our next guest has a huge task ahead of him as he is currently helping Khabib Nurmagomedov prepare for possibly his toughest test ever in Tony Ferguson. Not only is it the fight that everybody is talking about, it's also the fight that everybody is wondering if it will even happen. We have the former world champion kickboxer and co-founder of AKA himself, Javier Mendez. Javier, welcome back to Submission Radio. How are you in these crazy times, man? Yeah, crazy times. I think even my Skype got the coronavirus. I can't get on, so I don't know what the hell's going on. Yeah, yep. But you're kind enough to join us on the phone, so we appreciate it. That, that's right. Yeah, no problem, you guys are great. I'll tell you what, Casper mentioned it in the intro, and we should get right into it because we don't have much time, and that is how do you train for a fight you don't really know is even going to happen? Take us into what's happening right now at AKA and uh, yourself and Team Khabib. What are you guys thinking and how are you guys training and what is the mindset? Well, we're training like, like usual, except that we're shut down. The gym is shut down uh, by the government uh, or the, the not the government per se, but but the local politicians here, the the the, the um, excuse me, the, <clears throat> the 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 mayor, the mayor shut us down. So everybody shut down. If, if you're a, a necessity type of business, you can stay open. 
uh, you know, unnecessity type, which is my business. You have to close. Yeah. So we are closed at the present time. We can stay open for very few people, and, and it's Habib only and the people that, that he's training with uh, for the fight and a couple of the people. But it's very, uh, at the present time, there's hardly nobody here because that's what we have to do uh, to keep it. But as far as the motivation for the fight, it's still the same. We just wait to see what's going to happen but we're training uh like we have a fight because we need to when, when you hear dana white say that you know it's happening no matter what that's been the the echoed statement from him what is it really based on you know in your mind does does he tell you guys the plan or how they're gonna you know make this happen no matter what because you know he was saying the same thing about ufc london you know just days ago and then obviously we saw how that panned out <clears throat> Well, you know, it's out of his control. You know, there's a there's a lot of great things he's trying to get accomplished, but really, you know, the, there's you know, like in Nevada where they run Nevada, but they don't run Nevada because the State Athletic Commission has nothing to do with with the UFC, even though they have some power there. But obviously, they don't have the power to stay open. So, if you don't have enough power to stay open in your own state where you are very powerful, then I seriously doubt you have enough power to stay open somewhere else. Uh, they just have to find the right uh, scenario the right place that that doesn't have a lockdown on this uh, horrible uh, you know flu epidemic and a pandemic that's going around. So we'll see what happens. But you know, obviously Dana is, has to be optimistic, has to give the fighters hope, and he's doing everything in his power to make these things happen. And uh, I, I'm very optimistic that he's going to get it accomplished. So we'll mm. see, though. You know, we'll see. We've seen locations such as international waters. We've seen locations such as Russia. Some people are questioning if we can fly out to the moon just to make this fight happen. Can you break down for us uh, some of the locations that have sort of come across your desk and how far are you willing to go for, for Khabib to make this fight happen? How far are you guys willing to travel? Well, we as a team are willing to travel wherever the place uh, needs to happen. So wherever that may be, we're willing to travel. Um, <clears throat> where we have been told, uh, the apex in, in, in Las Vegas, but that got shot down because, like I said, the State Athletic Commission uh, stopped all fights from happening. So, you know, you don't have any power over them. And then I heard somewhere in Oklahoma, but that got shot down too. So uh, I don't know where else, uh, where they're going. Um, I read his father. I had a great idea, and I think it's a great idea. Uh, Abu Dhabi, you know, uh, I think that's that's a great place, mm. you know. But who knows, you know, what's what, what their rules are over there at the present time. It, it's a world pandemic that's preventing this from happening, and it, you know, it's it's kind of one of those, I don't know, day by day, you know. Yeah, <clears throat> I guess it's one of those things where it, it's 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 a countdown clock, and essentially you guys are getting ready for a fight, but there's also going to be a point. Where physically, if it looks like it's not going to happen, you guys are going to have to stop at a certain point. Obviously, you don't want to do things like weight cutting and putting Khabib in a position where he's going to put his body through things if you don't think the fight's going to happen. So as a coach yourself, Javier, a guy that's dealt with Khabib for such a long time, is there a cutoff date that you would need to know the location by in order to continue doing things like weight cutting and doing the last measure preparations for this fight? Is there sort of a date in mind that you and the team have that the UFC would have to lock yeah. this down? Yeah, of course. For me, it's the, it's the real, the date where the real hard cutting, uh, weight cutting comes into effect, and that's week of, you know, because that's when he really has to struggle. That's when it really is important. That's when he's putting his health in danger. But at the present time, he's training like he's fighting. His weight's good. His sparring is fantastic, you know. So uh, everything is great, you guys. Everything's great. It's just a matter of, you know, send me location, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just, just, and just on that sparring, it's something that's fascinating right now because people don't know how to handle this whole coronavirus. You mentioned that the gym's shut down and a bunch of gyms have shut, been shut down. But what kind of preca precautions are you guys taking in him training with his training partners? Obviously, you've reduced the people in the gym, but his training partners, how many partners does he have? And are they, are they doing stuff outside of training, like self-isolation and stuff like that to make sure they're not bringing the virus into the gym? He's only sticking with his core people and a few other ones that have been here. But the vast majority of his training partners is like his, like Umar, Islam, uh, other Islam, Abadha, uh, you know, and a few of uh, Tahir, you know, Saeed. These are all, all people, uh, you know, that, that they came with them. These are, these are the main people 
that he's working with. Uh, nobody really more outside of that because of the spread and also the fans. There is no fans outside, thank God, because he can't be because of this thing. He can't be out there with the fans because you just don't know, man. You just don't know. Uh, yeah, well, it's funny you mentioned the fans. Like, this fight is the hardcore fight. It's for the hardcore fans. It's, it's the epitome of a hardcore fan fight. But if it ends up being in an arena with no crowd, no fans, how weird would that would that be, uh, you know, if, if it ended up being that way? I, I personally think at the beginning they'll be weird. But once him and Tony start fighting, it ain't going to matter. Man, they got to beat the hell out of each other. So they're going to be too preoccupied with winning the fight and inflicting as much damage on each other that they ain't going to care about the fans. But at the beginning, yeah, it's going to feel weird at the beginning. Let's just look at this fight, Javier. Well, we have you on the line, Tony Ferguson versus Khabib Nurmagomedov. This is the first time this fight has been put together in a fight that people have been looking forward to, possibly the most looked forward to fight in MMA history. When you look at the way that this fight goes, and let's say it happens on the day that it's supposed to happen, how do you see it playing out? And where does Tony Ferguson rank for you as the toughest opponents that Khabib has ever had? Well, for me, oh, I just go by the toughest opponent. I think overall, I think Tony's the toughest opponent overall with everything skill set. Uh, Striking-wise, I think Connor, Connor was the best striker he's ever faced. But I think overall, I think uh, Tony's got the best overall skills out of anybody he's ever fought. Because uh, he's dangerous on the speed, he's dangerous on the ground. Uh, he's got decent wrestling. I mean, he's dangerous everywhere. Um, but you know, Habib also has improved a lot in, in so many different areas. That the last fight wasn't as good as he is this fight. So we're, we'll see a new Habib, uh, and we're definitely going to see a new Tony. But at the end of the day, you know, is Tony the toughest opponent? In, in some ways, yes. In other ways, no. Is it is it extra tricky because obviously Khabib's bread and butter is on the ground and he's going up against a guy who is quite more than happy and, and willing to be on the ground and he has so many tools uh, off his back. How do you sort of handle something like that? Well, well, we'll see when we get there, right? I mean, it's hard to say. You know, he's never fought someone like Tony. Tony's never fought someone like him. So we'll see what happens when Khabib takes him down because that's going to happen. And we'll see if Tony can do what he's used to doing, he, he may find he can't. And, and that may be one of the areas where he'll go, oh, crap, I didn't realize he was this good. Uh, mostly everybody that's ever dealt with him, that's what they come up saying, like, I didn't, I knew he was good, but I didn't know he was that good. Mm. So trust me when I tell you this, it's going to be more of Tony's going to be like, God damn it. You know, I thought I had it. I thought this, I thought that. Well, nope. Mm -hmm. I still, to this day, say if there's a person on the ground that could beat Habib will do more stand-up no I still don't believe there's one out there so he has an advantage in so many different areas and uh, but I think Habib you know at the end of the day he's going to do what he does best and father's plan will prevail mm. uh, obviously the fight is something that everyone's excited about but like just seeing these two guys interact with each other is always is always so fascinating it's always so fun to watch like Khabib against Connor at the press conference was kind of unfazed almost bored looking but against Tony at that press conference Tony got a real rise out of him Khabib got pretty animated more animated than we've seen in a long time what did you think of the Khabib you know you saw there at that press conference um do you think that Tony was able to sort of get under his skin a little bit no this is what happened uh right when we were we were outside getting ready to get introduced uh, about 15 minutes before I go hey listen I go we never talked about Tony and, and about the, the the games and this and that because he hasn't done anything so you haven't had that to worry about and I said to, to him I said hey you know what uh, with Connor I didn't want you to say anything more or less keep quiet which is what he did mm -hmm. for the majority of it you know and on this one here I just do what you want to do I said have fun with it if you want you know or, or not I go you're you're capable of of because Habib is extremely intelligent. I don't know if you guys, I think the vast majority of people figure out he's pretty witty, you know? Oh, yeah. He comes out with some really good sayings. So, you know, you, it, it's going to take a lot to really get right, hit, rile him up and really get him, but it isn't going to take as much for him to rile you up. He's pretty good at that. A lot of people talking about what's going to happen if this fight gets delayed. Coach, uh, people suggesting that if Tony doesn't get this fight now, maybe a, a guy like Conor McGregor might sort of leapfrog him. And then the next fight will be Khabib versus uh, Conor McGregor in the rematch rather than Tony Ferguson getting this title shot. 
What what are your thoughts on that? If this fight doesn't happen, is it guaranteed that you guys will give Tony that title shot still, or is it very likely that Conor McGregor will take that away? Well, this is the thing. If if uh, let's say there was nothing's happening, but let's just talk. They find a place for us to go, and let's just say Tony doesn't want to go. Habib's gonna want to fight whoever they put in front of him, whoever like like whoever you know like uh like Gazy, like like uh who's the guy that just beat uh, uh kevin lee uh charles Oliveira. you know charles Oliveira. uh someone that, that you know whatever he's like give me somebody you know that's what habib's attitude would be well, give me somebody if tony doesn't want to fight give me somebody and then we'll go after tony again mm. when, when he is ready you know um but, but i don't think tony i think he's in the same boat as habib tony's gonna go screw that i'm fighting I don't care where I got to go. I'm fighting that dude. I'll fight him at his house. And that's what I think. That Tony ain't going to stop for nothing. I mean, he's a true warrior, man. This is, I mean, what can't, you can't take nothing away from that man. He, he is a true warrior. He, he is a warrior through and through. He's a fighter through and through. And nothing's going to make him back down outside of something that's not in his control. So I don't like okay. that happening because I don't look at Tony saying, well, I ain't going to go fight that dude there. No, I don't think so. He's a real fighter. He's going to, He's going to go where he needs to go, just like Habib is. So both of these guys are real fighters. And it's going to come down to me, in my opinion, is who who is going to do the most damage to who? Because they're not going to break each other. Habib ain't going to break him, and Tony ain't going to break Habib. So it's who does the most damage. Mm, it's going to be absolutely fascinating. Last question, Coach, and we'll let you go, and we appreciate the time. Daniel Cormier is a man that was trying to make a comeback and obviously fight Stipe in his last fight. There might not be a UFC possibly until July, possibly to later, if this break sort of pushes out the UFC past 2020, is there a chance that because of this delay, we may never see Daniel Cormier fight again? Yes, it's possible you never may never see him fight again because he doesn't need to fight. He, he's well off. He's got uh, his his uh, his after-fight career in full gear. So, yeah, it's definitely possible. It's definitely possible, 100% possible. You know, I mean, he doesn't need to prove anything to to me or or himself, but it's a matter of what he wants, and I believe he wants the Stipe rematch, and that's the only one that that he wants at the present time. You know, um, so but I'm assuming that if things go right and he can regain that title, that Dana's going to want to keep him around. He's going to throw dangle the John Jones carrot at him, you know, at heavyweight, which will be a huge carrot. What would you prefer, wow, so Stipe, even- Stipe or, or or John Jones? What's that? What would you prefer? Like, if there's two carrots, Stipe or John Jones, what, what, what would you prefer? And also, that's wild that Daniel Cormier may Stipe. actually not come back. I, I want Stipe. If, if we get the one dangling carrot, only at Stipe. And uh, if, if because that's what he wants. And, and if, but if he retired, I'm good with that, too. Yeah. Right. Mm. So, 20, 2021, Coach, you think we still see Daniel Cormier fight, even with this whole coronavirus break, even as long as he gets the fights that he wants, or is you think there's that good chance that it might not happen because it's 2021? I hope he gets the fight, I hope he gets the fight once in 2020, and then he retires. Okay. Well, there it is there. Uh, crazy times right now. We appreciate the time. Of course, AK, one of the finest gyms and establishments. We wish you all the best, Coach. We know it's tough times right now with the coronavirus. It's tough for all the MMA gyms and all the MMA staff out there. We wish you all the best. And, of course, UFC 249, Khabib versus Tony Ferguson, April 18th. On a boat in international waters, Abu Dhabi. <laughs> what about Russia? We don't know. It's to be determined. But of who course, knows? Russia, I mean, wh- wherever it could be, no problem. It's just a- where. At, a- at AK Jav on Twitter, and of course, maybe at Javier's backyard. We know you've got that nice house, Javier. No more than 10 people. Hopefully, you invite us. Thank you so much for being on the program. All right, you guys. Thanks, guys. Hey, guys. It's TP Mutrich, a USC heavyweight champion, and you listen to Submission Radio. All right, guys, Chaos is his nickname, but this week he emerged as the hero maybe U.S. didn't need, but the the hero that the U.S. got, the great American saving machine. He put his hand in the air to fight Tyron Woodley at the now-canceled UFC London card on six days' notice. Six days' notice, the fight didn't go ahead, but he joins us here today, back on Submission Radio Colby Covington, why does it feel like it's been too long since you've been on Submission Radio? I know, it's it's been way too long, but, you know, I'm glad to be back on Submission, making it great again today. Always appreciate you coming on the show, Colby. Uh, man, got to ask, what have the last few days been like for you? I imagine uh, absolute roller coaster ride. 
Yeah, it's it's been uh, complete chaos, you know, just like my nickname, mm. you know, from from accepting a fight on six days notice, thinking I'm fighting six days to, you know, the world pretty much shutting down with this pandemic going on with the coronavirus. So, man, it's been crazy. But, you know, you know, I just try and keep a level head through it all. And uh, I'm going to come back and save the UFC and save the sports world and save ESPN one day. But, you know, it just sucks that I got robbed this weekend. You know, I had something special brewing. Been training really hard the last couple of weeks in American Top Team. And, uh, you know, I was going to put on a show. I was going to end uh, Tyron Woodley's career in fashion. Mm. We want to get to all of that and really go through all the details. But first, I want to touch on this kind of roller coaster ride that you've had with fans. Um, you know, after you fight with Usman, it seemed like a lot of fans were sort of down on you. And then after you put your hand up this week, it's a little bit like that roller coaster where everybody's going back up and everybody's big. On Colby Covington calling you the hero, the savior. What do you kind of make of this relationship that you have with the public? Uh, you know, I just make the, you know, I'm here for the public. All the fans know that I deliver for them. You know, I'm, I'm putting on an entertaining show for them year round. And I'm just trying to make their lives better. I'm trying to be the light in the darkness right now. Yeah, it's a dark time. There's some shitty times going right now. But you know what? There's some good things that we can look at. And we can look at perspective and I'm trying to be that that solid perspective that that makes people's lives better. Whether you want to come and talk shit about me, oh, you're the worst fighter, oh, you're fake, you're this and that, or if you want to love me, either way, you're going to be entertained, and I'm going to give you something to talk about. Mm. We know how much work you put into actually getting that title shot from the promotion stuff that you did, trying to build up that Woodley fight, eventually getting that Usman fight, and obviously things didn't go your way. And then, you know, there was all that criticism from fans about, you know, how this and that and the performance and the way it got finished. I'm just wondering, how did you sort of, how did you manage to get through that sort of low period in your life? We imagine you're a guy that doesn't get affected by much, but was it, was it a difficult time for you after that fight? No, I just, I thought about all my hardworking fellow Americans and, and I thought about when they had to face adversity and, and sometimes life isn't fair. And that's exactly what happened on December 14th. Life was not fair for me. I had a fake ref. I had fake uh, fouls called in the fight. I had a fake finish. It wasn't a real fight. But, you know, just like the American will and spirit, it, our will and spirit cannot be broken. So, you know, I'm coming back from already fake newsman. He can keep running. He can keep hiding, looking for these easy f fights with jobbers. But eventually we're going to get locked in that cave for 25 more minutes. And then there's going to be 25 more minutes when I end his career in the trilogy fight. So, you know, I just need a level playing field. You know, the best thing that's came out of this coronavirus is that they put a travel ban on the UK. Keep that shitty ass piece of shit ref Mark not so gooder over in the UK because he fucking sucks at his job and he needs a fucking new job because he doesn't know how to fucking officiate. Wow. Um, let, let, let's unpack sort of this past week for you, Colby. Uh, when did you first hear that the UFC London card was in trouble and when did the ufc approach you about this card was it them that approached you or did you approach them they approached me and uh but if they hadn't approached me about five minutes later i was about to approach them because i had first heard of you know the cancellation on saturday night like late night and i was like hmm i wonder how things are going to change you know dana said he was going to move it from london to america and i am america's champ and the people's champ so you know, it's only fitting that I come and save America, save the people live on ESPN. So, you know, Saturday night, su Sunday night, Sunday morning rolls around and the UFC calls me. Hey, are you interested in fighting Woodley? You know, maybe on an Indian reservation in California, maybe Oklahoma, maybe Alabama. I'm like, absolutely. I'm in. Count me in. You know, I've been training. I'm in great shape. You know, two months ago, I was with Cam Haynes, you know, starting my training camp on the mountains, getting that endurance up with the best endurance athlete in the world. So I feel very ready for this moment. And then, you know, all of a sudden Monday rolls around and, and Trump puts the ban that, you know, no more uh, large gatherings of 10 people or more. And, and once that came to fruition, we knew that the fight was going to get canceled Monday night. And that's what ended up happening, you know. So it was a roller coaster from thinking I'm fighting on Sunday, you know, the next day, uh, late night, thinking, you know, shit, I lost this big opportunity to go when no other sports are playing, uh, nothing else is going on in the world. You know, people need safe. They need some entertainment in their lives. And I was ready to come be that for them. And I got robbed of that opportunity. So, you know, I, I'm just, just kind of devastating a little bit hurt right now. 
Mm. Let's just get into that negotiation as well, because we know you had some issues with the UFC when you were negotiating that Usman title fight. They didn't really offer you a deal that you were happy with initially. What's your relationship like with Dana White and the UFC now? And did they come with a deal that you found acceptable? Yeah, our relationship's fine. Uh, they understand who uh, the numbers are in this business and, and who's doing big numbers and doing good business for them. So, you know, that's all I've ever tried to do for this company is, is put this company before myself. Look at me. I was willing to go fight on six days notice to save this company, to save the show, to save ESPN, to save everybody, to save America and all the people around the world, all the fans watching, you know. So, you know, now they see my worth and, and my willingness and readiness to save something and always be ready. I'm ready, man. You want to fight on one day's notice? Let's do it. Why is it that mm. I'm coming out? I'm ready to fight before Marty Fake Newsman. How, how did that happen? So, you know, everybody that wanted to be uh, these critics saying, oh, I broke my jaw. If I broke a jaw, how am I ready to fight two and a half months later on a week's notice if I broke my jaw? So I'm sick of the fake news out there. I'm sick of all these people trying to chase clout. I'm here to fight. And I'm here to make this sport great again. We remember you spoke to us a little bit about when you were frustrated with the UFC. You said, you know, you wanted out of your contract if they didn't sort of offer you what you deserved, that they didn't really appreciate you for what you bring to the table. At, at this moment, obviously, this time Woodley fight almost came together. But do you see yourself sticking around in the UFC for the rest of your career? Do you think they're going to be using you and appreciating you for the work that you've been doing? Or is there a possibility that not so long down, down the stretch, you might be in a different company that appreciates you more? Um, you know, I think with what's going on in the world right now, you know, it kind of relates, you know, it's, there's a, there's some correlation that there's really no way to predict, you know, what's going to happen next. All you can do is take it one day at a time, you know, keep believing, keep working hard and not panicking more importantly. And, uh, you know, we'll see what happens next. You know, I love the UFC. I love being a part of the UFC. It's a great honor, but I'm also a businessman. I didn't come here to make friends. I came here to do business and, and if they don't want to do business, then that's okay. I can go somewhere else and do business too. But that's not going to change the fact who's the best welterweight in the world. That's myself. And no one's stopping me anytime soon. I'm young. I just got started. And you haven't seen the best of me yet. Every single time I step in that octagon, I get better. And nothing's going to change in the future. Mm. It, it, it took you so long to get that initial title shot. If they refuse to give you that title shot, let's say you go back out there against Tyron Woodley and you win, and they refuse to give you that title shot. Would that be something that would make you think about going somewhere else? Oh, uh, you know, it just it depends on how big the check was. It, it, if they're paying me title money, you know, I deserve title money. I'm a champion. I never lost my title. Everybody knows I had the world championship, America's uh, championship, Donald Trump's favorite fighter championship. <laughs> so everybody knows I'm, I, I'm the real champion in this division. I defended that title two times and. You know, all my other fights, they're all world title fights. So the biggest fights of magnitude that you can get. And, uh, you know, if the UFC doesn't see that worth and they don't want to pay up, you know, even a half a fraction of what I deserve, you know, because, you know, I, I, I put my whole life on this company, you know, went to Brazil when I had death threats and, and had, uh, you know, favelas that wanted a bounty on my head. I still was willing to go risk my life for this company. So the UFC should see, see that I'm, I'm willing to put it all on the line for this company and, and I deserve to be treated fairly. Uh, I'm just wondering, Colby, you sort of laid it out well for us, you know, what, what exactly happened, you know, in the negotiations and stuff like that. Um, but obviously Tyron Woodley came out and he claimed that, you know, you didn't accept the fight, that you were just, he, I think he claimed that you said you were just kidding when it came down to actually sort of signing. I was just wondering sort of what your side of the story was and what you thought about him, you know, coming out and saying that. I think that Tyron Woodley's doing what he always does. He's the CNN of the UFC. He's fake news. You can't believe anything Tyron Woodley says. The guy's so full of shit, his eyes are brown. I mean, it's, it's absolutely pathetic, the narratives that he tries to run out of his mouth. I mean, dude, the guy got backed in a corner. He was going to fight some no-name guy named Leon Scott. And then they were talking about him fighting some no-name dude named Dilbert. Like, Dilbert? What the fuck is a Dilbert? Dude, what, what are you talking about, Tyron Woodley? I begged to fight you. You've been begging not to fight me. So, you know, let's get the facts straight. I signed a contract. I was ready to fight you. You never signed a contract to fight me. You don't want to fight me. And he's talking about me chasing clout, looking for that fight. Bitch, I am the clout. I'm the numbers. Go look at the numbers. There's a reason nobody cares about Tyron Woodley anymore because he just spits fake news. There's nothing real or truthful about him. At least I'm honest and I'm real. Yeah, you know what? 
I say some mean things sometimes. Yeah, I hurt some guys' feelings sometimes. I'm sorry. I'm a professional fighter in the professional fighting business, so I'm sorry if I hurt your your feelings, Marks. <laughs> uh, let me ask you this. I mean, you signed the contract. You wanted to fight Woodley. In your mind, is that the next fight that needs to happen once things get up and running again? Obviously, Leon Edwards is over there in the wings. The fight didn't happen. So in your mind, is it you versus Tyron Woodley next for whenever the UFC returns with the next card? No, it's it's not. It's it's me and Marty Fake Newsman round two. That motherfucker escaped after faking fouls in the fight, changing the momentum of the fight. I kicked him in the liver, and he was ready to quit in that second round. You can see it in his face. He took five minutes and faked a fucking nut shot, sat on the ground, you know, like a fake actor acting like he really got his nuts hit. But actually, the camera showed, dude, you got hit, hit in the liver. And then his fake foul in the third round where he's faking an eye poke, he gets five minutes to recover. It's a complete momentum change. And then he pokes me in the eye, and Mark Goddard says, oh, no, no more timeouts. So he acknowledged he gave Marty Fake Newsman timeouts before that, and he still didn't give me a timeout. But that's okay, because I don't want any life rafts. I keep fighting through it all. And then the bullshit stoppage, the guy's hit me in the back of the head five or six times. And, and then you call a stop when I'm intelligently defending myself? Like, where's the where's the consistency in the calls? You let Frankie Edgar die the next week, a legend. So Mark not so Goddard should honestly have his, his referees re provoke, revoke from him. He's, he's an incompetent ref. He shouldn't be out there. And any fighter out there, this is a message for all the pro fighters out there. If, if they talk about him being your ref, I mean, you might as well not show up because he's going to fuck you. Well, this or is he's going to get paid off to take a dive. I was, I was going to say, this is fascinating because Tyra Woodley is basically saying that there's only one person that he wants, or, or he, he, he wants you, and he doesn't want to hear any other name. So he's very set on fighting you next. But you're saying, uh, is it fair to assume that that ship has sort of sailed? You're targeting Usman now, and then that Woodley fight won't happen? Yeah, I mean, I begged for Woodley. I wanted to fight him for so many years, you know, four years. I prepackaged that fight, you know, calling him out, you know. He's too busy with this fucking shitty ass rap career, and now he's broke, so he needs a big fight because his rap career ain't going nowhere. And and TMZ fired him because they were sick of him talking about the Kardashians. They they couldn't keep airing the same episodes every week. So, you know that ship is sailed with Tyrone Woodley. I, I got bigger and better things in business to handle, and that's what Marty Fake Newsman. I was willing yeah, to man. save the day for the UFC and step up on six days' notice to fight Woodley, but with a full camp, I, I want my title shot and I want Marty Fake Newsman. <laughs> Tell you what, man, the Kardashians have put a lot of athletes out of business. Tyron Woodley, just another example of that. Let me just ask you this, though, man. A lot of people, obviously, are talking about that Masvidal is getting the next title shot. We've seen reports. It looks like the deal is still going to come together. What is your response to the fact that he's likely to get the next title shot? Is it a situation where you wait until that fight happens? Or will you sort of be forced to fight again because these guys are going to be fighting for the title next? Let's, let's be honest, you know, guys. Because uh, that's what Submission Radio is all about, real news, honesty. Mm, you know, thank they've you. been talking about, they've been fight, they've been talking about this fight with journeyman George Masvidal, aka the Street Judas, against Marty Fake Newsman for two, three months now. Why has this fight not been signed? Because Colby knows exactly what's been going on and called it from the start from the media. I told the media, I said, hey, journeyman George Masvidal scared to fight Marty Fake Newsman. He doesn't want to fight him. He wants more money than he's worth. He's going to wait out to try and get the Connor fight, and he's going to realize that he overplayed his hand, and he's an overhyped job. He hit lightning in a bottle. No one's going to care about him in a couple months. But, you know, yeah, they're talking about the fight, but I don't think it's ever going to happen. I hope it does. You know, I'd love to fight the winner. It's, it's an easy fight. But, you know, I think I deserve my rematch. Go look at that. Go watch that tape of what happened on December 14th, you know. One of the big, biggest shows of the year, you know, sold out arena. People want to see this, and they know how I got fucked. They know that, you know, I had to face some adversity, and, and I got cheated, and I got screwed, but you don't see me complaining. I'm out here. All I want is my rematch. I'm not complaining. I'm not making excuses. I just want to show the world who the real champion is, and that's me. Hmm. I, I, think the, the, I think the rematch between yourself and Usman is, is something that people definitely want to see at some point. I'm just wondering, have you spoken to the UFC a, about this plan and have you sort of gauged, you know, their reaction? I know, like Dennis mentioned, obviously, they're sort of in the middle of negotiations for Usman and Masvidal. But have, have you run this past them and, and what do they think about you jumping in? Yeah, they, they like the idea that, you know, they saw with their own two eyes. They're not blind. I mean, I, I hope not. But uh 
some of them, you know, they saw what happened. You know, I, I won that fight. I was winning 24 minutes of that fight in the last minute. Uh, Mark Goddard wants to rob me and, and stop the fight, you know, which, which is complete bullshit because I told him in, their, in, in the locker room, I said, Mark, don't you stop this fight at any moment unless I'm completely dead and unconscious. Otherwise, this is what I signed up for. I signed up to be a professional fighter, to get locked in the octagon and to kill or be killed. And neither one of those happened. I was killing and I wobbled Usman multiple times and I was winning, you know, three, four rounds out of that five round fight. And they were about to wrap that belt around me. Again, but Mark Not So Goddard got paid off by somebody in the UK who who must be a big fan of Mike Bisping or Daryl the Doughboy Till. So you know <laughs> that's why he got paid off. Man, I'll tell you what, this is this is a whole conspiracy theory that just goes deeper and deeper and de deeper. Let me ask you this though. If you are fighting, uh, let's say uh, for some reason the UFC does put together this Mazadal Usman fight because it does look like it's next. If you had to guess who you'd be fighting out of that, who would be the champion? Who do you think is going to win between Mazadal and Usman and be your next opponent for the title? Yeah, I'll, I'll get my rematch with Marty Fake Newsman one way or another. He, he's got nowhere to go. You know, we we will settle this. There's there's still there's still 50 more minutes of fighting, man. We still got 10 more rounds of this. You've only seen round one. This this is we only have one battle. The war is still to come. He has not seen the best me yet. He's Marty Fake Newsman beat me on my worst day when he was on his best day, and he didn't even beat me. He had to have an incompetent incompetent ref. He had to have incompetent calls. And he had to have a bullshit fake fight, fake ref, and fake stopping. So I'm going to get my rematch with Marty one way or another. Everybody knows journeyman George Mosfidal has no takedown defense. He's not a complete mixed martial artist fighter. You saw when he fought guys like Damian Maia, he got beat up. He got exposed by Stephen Wonderboy Thompson. He was getting beat up by nobody's name, Rodrigo Dam, an inverted triangle by a Toby Imada. What's a Toby Imada, guys? <laughs> Uh, I'm, I'm just wondering, Colby, uh, as far as like a, a return time frame for you, when when do you see that happening? I know that with this whole coronavirus thing, we, everyone's kind of in the dark, but I'm just wondering if you have any kind of like loose plans where, where you can look at, you know, sometime later in the calendar year for when you would like to return. And uh, I'm just wondering, would you be open to fighting in an empty arena? Because I feel like you versus Usman, you versus Woodley, you versus anyone in the division, it, it kind of needs to have a crowd, you know, especially for your entrances. Yeah, you know, the good thing is that President Trump has everything in control in America, so I already know that in a couple of weeks everything's going to be back to normal and we can get back to doing what we do best, putting on shows and, and entertaining the fans around the world. So, you know, the thing about me is I stay ready year-round, like I've told you guys in the past, and if the UFC calls me up on a week's notice, just, you know, just like they just did last week, I'm ready to go. I stay ready. I'm preparing every single day. I'm getting better, and I stay in good cardio shape. You know, I, I have a lot of cardio that I'm always practicing in the bedroom. So my bedroom cardio is at all time, all time high. And it's just going to translate to my championship rounds cardio. So, you know, I, I, I prefer to get back in there is the sooner the better, but we just don't know how things are going to go. So we just have to take them day by day and, and see how things play out. But, you know, yeah, I, I feel like we would be robbed if the, if the fans weren't in the arena when I was fighting, you know, I was willing to go when there was no fans because I wanted to save the day. I wanted to save the world from what's going on right now. People are betting on sports. Or people are betting on the weather. <laughs> I, I see my friend was freaking out the other day. He was like, what the fuck? I bet on the, the weather to rain. Why did it not rain? I was like, dude, you need something better with your life, man. I need to come back and save the sports world and, and, and entertain the people. Because if they're betting on the weather, man, they need something better to bet on. So, you know, I'm, I could fight in empty arena, full arena. It doesn't matter. I'm just here to fight. I'm here to make the sport great again. And I'm here to make the people happy again. Mm. A couple of good questions before we let you go, Colby. First of all, Khabib uh, versus Tony. Do you believe this fight happens? What do you? What? What is, what is your prediction? I do not believe the fight happens. I think the fight is cursed, and uh, yeah, I think the the fight's cursed, and it's always been cursed, and it's just never going to happen. I guess. It's such a shame mm. because obviously, along with you know the rematch between you and Usman, you know Tony and Khabib is just a fight that obviously all the fans want to see. If it does happen, maybe on, I don't know, submarine in the Pacific Ocean or some kind of raft floating around in the Atlantic where, where there's no rules, who, who would you sort of give the edge to in that fight? Oh, man. Yeah, that's a tough one. I, I really don't know. I think it uh, it's a good stylistic matchup. They both have uh, skill sets against each other, do well against each other. Tony has a submission, some elbows, you know, some decent 
uh, abilities to beat Khabib, but Khabib's pressure and his wrestling might be too much for Tony. So I don't know. That's what makes the fight so good is that you, you don't know which way it could go. You know, both guys are crazy in their own right. And, and uh, they're little lightweights, but, you know, they can fight for little kids. Mm. And finally, oh, as we... Speaking of lightweights, I just want to take this moment, guys, to apologize real quick. I want to apologize to my teammate, Dustin Poirier. I, you know, I broke a promise to my agent, Dan Lambert, and I, I, I really do feel bad, man. I feel ashamed. Yesterday, mm-hmm. I was asked a question by Helwani about Dustin, my teammate, and uh, I kind of lost my cool. I was, I was too busy spitting fire on the world, and I was so hyped up about the Woodley fight that, you know, I kind of want to walk on Dustin. I just, you know, I just want to say that I'm sorry, Dustin. You're still my friend. We can be friends. I'm sorry about hurting your feelings and saying some words in the past that might hurt your feelings. Uh, and, uh, you know, business goes back to usual at American Top Team. I want to have a civil civil gym, and I don't want there to be drama or beef in the gym. I, I want to keep things civil. And if any of these guys want to come fight me, anybody out there, you, you know where to find me. We can fight for a lot of money in the octagon, but why aren't these guys talking about fighting me in the octagon? They just keep talking about fighting me in the street. Wow, an apology from Colby Covington. This is this is a, a massive rarity. This is like the exclusive of all exclusive. Just wondering, mm. sort of, what what made you want to sort of apologize? When did you start first thinking about you know settling settling this with you know your good friend Dustin Poirier? Yeah, you know, I I, I never apologize, and I can't believe I'm doing it here today with you guys. But you know, mm. that's how much trust I have in you guys and faith in you guys. And uh, you know, what made me want to apologize is I, I'm really apologizing to Dan Lambert. I broke a promise. Mm-hmm. You know, we made a promise that, you know, he's in a different weight class. He's a lightweight. I'm a welterweight. Uh, you know, what our business and our paths are not going to cross. So there's no reason to talk about each other. Let's let's keep everything, you know, normal at the gym. And, and guys can interact and train and, and they can hate each other. But we have enough space at the gym where there shouldn't be any problems. Let's just handle our business. And and I broke that promise with Dan, and I told him I wasn't going to talk about Dustin. He's not going to talk about me, and, you know, I'm ashamed, man. I'm usually uh, uh, not like this, but, you know, I'm a man to admit when I'm wrong, and I'm wrong. I made a mistake. I'm just like every other American out there. We make mistakes, and, and the, the more important thing is that we learn from our mistakes, and I've learned from my mistake, and I, I'm going to be better. I'm sorry, Dan Lambert. Sorry, Dustin. Love you guys. America top team forever. Mm-hmm. And just quickly, as we wrap up, Colby, I mean, if if you see Dustin next or if Dustin does listen to this, what's your message to him? Do you want him to come over? Do you want him to speak to you? Do you want to sort of somehow mend this whole thing in person? What What's the plan from here? Yeah, you know, I'd like to sit down with him, have a little chat, you know, speak to him eye to eye, you know, get a gauge and feel for how he's feeling and thinking and, and let him get some things off his chest, you know, and then, and then me rebuttal and tell him the truth and, and let me get some things off my chest where, I, where I believe, you know, we're both stubborn in our own ways and, and uh, you know, we're hard headed and we're both fighters and we love to fight. So let's just, let's just worry about fighting and, and preparing for our fights. He has a big fight coming up with somebody and, you know, I'm worried about getting my rematch and getting my belt back. So, you know, let's just go our separate ways and, uh, let, by, let, let bygones be guy, bygones. And, and while, while you're sort of talking about ATT, what about a couple of the, these other people you've had beef with, with guys like Jorge Masvidal or uh, like Ioana Andrejcik? Are you trying to sort of mend fences with all of them or is it just Dustin to this one? Nope, just Dustin. Uh, What's your message Mas- to, the, to Jorge and Ioana <laughs> if they're listening? Uh, what's my message to Jorge, journeyman George Masvidal, a.k.a. Street Judas, the guy who tried to stab me in the back for, for money and business. He, you know, he, you got your ass whooping waiting, buddy. You know, you got your, your 10 seconds of fame. They're up. You hit lightning in a bottle, you know. But let's look at your record, buddy. You got double-digit losses on your record. You're a 50-50 average mediocre fighter. Stop acting like you're so great. You ain't great. You know what happens when we used to train for the last eight, nine years. It's never been one second where you ever, ever beat me. So, you know, if you want to get embarrassed in front of the world, let's do it because – you know, George keeps talking about wanting to fight in the street. It's like, dude, if we fight in the street, who's going to pay your medical bills, George? At least if we fight in the UFC octagon, I'm going to break your jaw. I'm going to rearrange your face, and the UFC will cover your medical bills. So let's leave our business in the octagon. But he, he don't want to fight me in the octagon. He knows better than that. And as far as Joanna Jordacek, you know, his little side piece that they got a little fling going on right now, I could give a fuck less about her. She's she's washed up. Nobody cares about her. She used to be the boogie the boogie woman. Now she's the booby woman. You know, look at her face. She got her face rearranged. And I called it. 
uh, in the beginning of the week, I, I put a video out the week before a fight. I said, hey, guys, Joanna's going to get her. Joanna wants an apology for me. So here I am for my apology. Joanna, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that you had to get your face rearranged and everybody's going to get rich at mybookie.ag. And that's exactly what happened. I got rich. I made a Rolex off of Joanna Janacek's bitch ass. Well, well, there you guys go. Of course, you can follow the man at Colby Cov MMA. He is the DTFC, Donald Trump's favorite champion. And we do appreciate you coming into the program, Colby. We, we hope to see you back in there sooner than later. And uh, always, always a memorable time having you on the program. Stay away from those uh, coronavirus ladies as well. You might have to reduce the pool for the next couple of months, I'm afraid <laughs> to say. I'm quarantining from all from all these hoes out there. I'm just I'm trying to get back in that UFC octagon as soon as possible. Thanks, Colby. Appreciate it. All right, boys, be good. And there you go, guys. Colby Covington stopping by the program once again. Wild. I mean, I, I expected him to talk about the Usman rematch. I did not expect him to give any apologies, let alone to Dustin Poirier. And then the way he finished it off, no apologies for Jorge Masvidal or Yoani and J Trek. Uh, a, a somehow unhinged Colby Covington. Wild interview. Wild interview. Didn't expect that. Yeah, unbelievable. Every time the guy comes on the program, something always happens. I love I love having mm. him on the show, and we appreciate all of him. Of course, John Anik, Ben Askren, Javier Mendez, and Colby Covington for coming onto the program. We appreciate you guys. We want you guys to make sure to stay positive. Try not to worry about too much. Enjoy your time at home or wherever you are. And, of course, we will be back with another episode of Submission Radio. Throw your comments, thoughts, anything that you have down below, and we will catch you guys next week.